All right, welcome everyone. Today's event is being offered in Spanish as well as in English. Thank you for joining us. I am Kira Epstein, the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. I'm here with Kamala Tully, executive director at the Mesa Refuge, and with Heather Clapp, the director of community engagement and philanthropy at the Point Reyes National Seashore Association. And we're so pleased and honored to co-present the third of our Empowering Women in Today's World conversation series. Um, today, we welcome back Lyons Filmer as our host, and we are so honored to welcome author, advocate, and outdoors woman, Rue Mapp, for a conversation about nature swagger, celebrating Black joy and healing in nature. Lyons will introduce herself and Rue more in a bit, but first I want to say that Kamala and I have loved putting this series of conversations together that uplift three incredible women doing amazing things in our world today. Many thanks to the West Marin Fund for providing some of the funding that allowed us to offer this series and to offer Spanish translation. This is our first foray into live Spanish translation and Flavia is amazing. A few words about the New School at Commonweal. Um, we offer conversations, lectures, and art events that encourage dialogue around nature, culture, and inner life. And we've been doing this for more than 15 years now. We have about 300 conversations, uh, conversation mm -hmm. recordings, and you can find them on our website, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And this event is being recorded and produced video and podcast files will be posted to all of our media sites. One more big thank you to Lyons, Kamala, Flavia, and Rue's whole team for helping us bring this together. Okay, I think that does it for housekeeping. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather Clapp, Director of Community Engagement and Philanthropy at the Point Reyes National Seashore Association. After I just say, Rue Map and Lions Filmer, the Mesa Refuge team, and the Point Reyes National Seashore Association, welcome to the New School at Commonweal. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, everyone. I love all of the work that you are all doing. So I feel very honored to be here today for this third part of your series in your conversation with Rue Map. Um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that I am zooming in from the ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok here. Um, on within the Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, and uh, as, as Kira mentioned, uh, my name is Heather Clapp. I am the Director of Community Engagement and Philanthropy for Point Reyes National Seashore Association. Uh, it's a mouthful, so we call it PRINZA for short. Um, we're the nonprofit partner to the Park Service at Point Reyes National Seashore, and we provide opportunities for all people to experience, enhance, care for, maintain and maintain this special park for present and future generations. Uh, we do this through our core pillars, which are conservation, education, and community building. And uh, to, to, to bring things down to equity in the outdoors and, and what, what the focus is of this program today, I'd like to just point out one of our core programs um, that, that's called Youth and Parks. Um, Marin is one of the most segregated counties in California. Uh, while it is a beautiful national seashore, there's 80 miles of coastline and there's no entry fee. It is not easily accessed by those who who live even in our neighboring communities like Marin City, San Rafael, et cetera, due to lack of transportation. So Youth and Parks, YIP for short, is a partnership uh, between our, our organization and Bay Area and local Bay Area nonprofit organizations focused on community building and mentorship, primarily in BIPOC and low-income communities. Uh, YIP allows us to offer experiences in the national park to youth who have been historically uh, who have historically been underrepresented in national parks and in public lands and who are disproportionately impacted by environmental and social inequities. So it's a beautiful program which offers many firsts, uh, first visit to the ocean, first hike in the woods, even the first time visiting a national park, 
We're really proud of this work, um, which relies on building long-term relationships with partners from around the Bay Area for youth and really honored to be here. So thank you for allowing me that introduction. I will turn it over to Kamala now. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Welcome Lyons and Rue and Heather. Thank you for highlighting too what Prinza is doing um, as far as making the park a more accessible place for all people. It is That is really important work and um, I certainly appreciate all you guys are doing. And we are so grateful to be partnering with the new school in this three-part series. This is our last event of the series and offering these conversations in Spanish. Um, it's really been a breakthrough for us to do this kind of programming and um, and we'd like to do more of it. So, so Mesa Refuge is a, writer's re is a retreat for writers and activists in Point Reyes Station on Coast Miwok land. And for the past 25 years, we've been supporting over a thousand writers, activists, radio journalists, and filmmakers who are courageously imagining a more equitable world, including Rue Mapp who worked on her new book, Nature Swagger at Mesa Refuge in 2013. And Rue has been, uh, was also a speaker in the Geography of Hope Conference in Point Reyes Station in 2018. Um, she is no stranger to Point Reyes National Seashore area. So as I'm sure she might, she might disclose in her conversation today. But Rue, I just have to say your book is making the rounds at Mesa Refuge. It's going uh, between alums and staff and our board. It's a hot ticket item in our library. So I just wanted you to know that. Um, we are so proud of all our Mesa alums for who they are in the world and the ideas and values they're uplifting and how they're shaping public conversations, challenging restrictive policies and oppressive systems. Thank you, Rue, for sharing your inspiring stories of, of um, encouraging Black communities to reclaim their space in nature. And now I'd like to turn this over to Lyons and to Rue. Thank you. Thank you, Kamala. I'm Lyons Filmer. I've been in radio for over 30 years, and so I feel rather undressed without headphones and a mic. So today I'm very comfortable. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little crazy. Uh, I was uh, I, I did radio in college a million years ago. In the 1990s, I was a volunteer programmer at KPFA in Berkeley. I worked out of the women's department, the drama and lit department, and public affairs. In 1999, I joined as a volunteer programmer at KWMR and had the good fortune to become the program director there about uh, 18 months later. I was following in the footsteps of our founding program director, Muriel Merch. Shout out to Muriel for getting KWMR off the air, on the air, off the ground. <laughs> Uh, I do a number of programs at KWMR, one of which is Mesa Refuge Interviews, and we've been doing this for several years now. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk with a lot of really wonderful folks like RUMAP. Uh, I'm also an alum of the Mesa Refuge re residencies, and uh, I know how wonderful that experience is. So thinking of my experiences in nature, growing up, my family did quite a bit of camping. We didn't have tents in those days, uh, couldn't afford them, and they weren't as readily available. And sleeping bags were those heavy, you know, dense cotton or thick wool things that you had to drag around. You couldn't possibly go backpacking with it. But my favorite activity was climbing trees. And I still do that a little bit, but not as much as I used to. Wonderful. Um, I'm so happy to be talking with you this morning, Rue Mapp. Uh, Rue Mapp is a simply remarkable woman. She's the founder and CEO of Oakland-based Outdoor Afro, a not-for-profit organization that celebrates and inspires Black connections and leadership in nature. With active participants in more than 30 states, in September 2022, Chronicle Books published the book we've just heard about, Nature Swagger, Stories and Visions of Black Joy in the Outdoors, with its vibrant photography and individual stories about Black lives and healing in nature. Rue is a 2013 alum of Mesa Refuge Writers Retreat and a Mesa Refuge Changemaker, which is an important role at Mesa Refuge. Um, 
Rue became a National Geographic 2019 Fellow, a Heinz Award honoree, National Wildlife Federation Communication Award recipient, among, among many other recognitions, including being invited to the White House to participate in the America's Great Outdoors Conference. That led her to participate in the launch of former First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative. She did and does all this and much more while raising her three children. Welcome, Rue Map. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to just uh, let you all know how much I appreciate this, what I feel is a full circle moment. Um, the new school in Commonweal and Mesa Refuge and Prinza, uh, <laughs> you know, all together um, tell a beautiful story of connect connecting people to both people and place. Um, and I just want to especially thank the Mesa Refuge for um, helping me along in this big Harry audacious goal of <laughs> bring myself as a writer. And you heard 2013 and you know what year we're in right now. Right. <laughs> so I just want to ground people. Um, if you've got a book on your heart, you know, it might take a while for that baby to be born, but it will be in its own time. Um, so stay encouraged if you're out there dreaming of your book and Mesa Refuge and the entire community um, and Point Reyes um, is is here to support you. Thank you for those encouraging words, Rue. I really appreciate hearing them for my own secret inner plot of a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a well, it, it's a process. Um, so I just want to show to the camera with my stickies uh, the cover of your wonderful book, Nature Swagger. And having read the acknowledgments, which I tend to do first thing when I read a book, um, it's clear that you have received a lot of support and help and a number of people creating Outdoor Afro, the book, all the activities that you do. But clearly, this would not have occurred even with that help if you didn't have the courage and perceptiveness and vision that is native to you. Um, I just really want to say how how incredible your journey has been and this absolutely gorgeous book. I really encourage people to go get a hold of it because the photographs are so exciting and the stories are so inspiring. Uh, it's just, I, I feel joy myself reading that book and going back over it again and again and going, oh yeah, black girls climb trees. That's right. <laughs> there are all kinds of incredible stories that are are so worth reading. It's a beautiful expression of joy in nature. And I'd, I'd love to have you talk about the word joy, but maybe after the introduction, you're going to read for us. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for your generous words. And and you're using the book and in, and having a relationship with the book as intended. Um, you know, it's not a sit down and read the whole thing from cover to cover. It's meant to just be there for you to touch in and and um, and we can talk more about, you know, that intention around accessibility um, for all kinds of readers. Um, but yes, I'd like to start by reading the introduction. I feel that the introduction is um, is a way of setting the table for the why of this book mm -hmm. and, and my journey. Um, so I'm going to put on my number two readers because I am a woman of a certain age. <laughs> and the eyes start doing funny and things. the eyes and i chose a, i chose a font size that requires it so <laughs> well, um, you, had, you had a lot to say and so did the participants exactly exactly yeah. so without further ado the introduction which is titled a standing invitation our family's ranch in Lake County, California, stood on 14 acres of land covered in English walnut trees and sprawling oak trees that shaded our modest home. The entrance to our driveway was flanked by a rock masonry frame and hanging from it was a homemade black and white sign with letters carved out by a wood router, Big Oak. It was a remarkable corner lot with open ranch fencing on two sides that allowed anyone driving by to easily take in what was going on in the yard. 
people routinely slowed as they rounded the corner to see what lively events were happening at Big Oak. The land was lovingly and purposefully tended to by my father, A.C. Levias, who delighted in creating both its form and function to enhance the experience for our bi-weekly family runs and for everyone who frequently visited our ranch. There was a barn and a shop built with symbiotic purposes in mind. These would be where we built the pen that housed our pigs and other livestock. Beyond that lay a bountiful vegetable garden, vines heavy with grapes and and trees uh, with fruit in the summer. My father also built a walk-in smokehouse, a swimming pool, a swing set, and eventually a tennis court. Altogether, our ranch was a place that holistically embodied outdoorsman grit with a nod to community entertainment and a resort-style twang. My dad was a Black man from the Jim Crow South with an eighth grade education who had the audacity to create a place like this in a nearly all-white town. But he was respected in the community. And on one occasion, the county newspaper covered one of our large family events on its front page. As a child, I was always thrilled to visit the ranch. I delighted in taking part in hunting, fishing, and exploring the surrounding woodlands along country roads by foot or on my bike. Nearby Copsey Creek was an oasis of discovery and learning about aquatic ecosystems, as well as the seasonal flow of water. I recall many times getting out of the car and wondering if those tadpoles or pollywogs I saw a couple of weeks before had turned into frogs. How high was the river after a big rain? At the ranch, I fell deeply in love with nature. More than just bountiful and beautiful land, the ranch was also a site for celebration, where we invited family, friends, and members of the community to enjoy holidays, parties, and reunions. I especially loved when we kids put together talent shows for the adults who would spend the day talking, laughing, and playing games like bidwis and dominoes. I received lessons in hospitality at the ranch. My dad had a famous saying, you have a standing invitation. Meaning, once you have visited our home, you are always welcome back. Sometimes there would be so many people dropping by or staying over, it felt like the house might explode. But there was always enough room for everyone. Even if it meant people slept on the kitchen floor with a homemade quilt, or under a makeshift sheet tent outside, and there was always something cooking or ready on the stove, on the grill, or right out out of the oven. One more barbecued rib, a bowl of collard greens, a slice of 7-Up cake, a cup of punch, nothing lacking. The hospitality my parents showed everyone is still unsurpassed and still raved about to this day. Those welcoming ways of the ranch meant that adults and children alike could experience wonder under the bright stars at night, unseen back home in a light polluted cityscape. Air so fresh and fragrant of lake and oak woodlands, the euphoric sound and experience of silence. I had a front row seat to the community, the joy of that community in nature, which brought about in me a yearning to create and be a part of something like it for the rest of my life. Back home in Oakland, I participated in Girl Scouts, which reminded me of the intimacy and affinity of the community on my family ranch. I love the Girl Scout mottos, our songs, and our rituals, but the highlight was learning how to camp. Mind you, my family had been an outdoor-loving family but no one saw the need or had the wherewithal to camp. That might've been regarded as something other people do. After my first experience with my Girl Scout troop, I was hooked on camping and everything it encompassed. Even chores were more fun tackled as a group in nature while singing songs. It was at this time that I started a diary, a prized Hello Kitty red padded book with empty lines of possibility. 
In those pages, I was especially drawn to capturing my time in nature in painstaking detail through my new curly cursive. I wrote what I saw and what I did and shared the stories of how we related to one another in our pop-up community. Around this time, I became fascinated with technology. Growing up in the Bay Area meant being exposed to the cutting edge of early computer technology. Carl B. Monk, my Oakland Public Elementary School, had Commodore PET computers in our classroom. By the age of 10, I was programming basic language so easily that my parents purchased a home version of the Commodore for me so I could continue to practice this new skill and passion. I would sometimes bring my computer to the ranch and practice programming in quieter moments. I eventually found my passion for activism and community service in college through both the Black Student Union and Women's Center, where I would make lifelong friends. By the early 90s, I had a capstone experience mountaineering with Outward Bound and summited peaks in the high Sierra as the only Black woman in our group. That trip summed up an acute awareness in me to understand nature as a powerful teacher, while also highlighting the isolation I felt as a young Black woman still trying to navigate young adulthood in a new remote wilderness setting with people who shared cultural experiences different than my own. Out of my experience using digital technology over the years, it was easy to become an early adopter of the internet. And with the renewed focus on the outdoors as a young adult, I sought out other outdoor enthusiast discussion groups on the World Wide Web's Usenet. But my in-person group experiences that came out of those discussions were not satisfying. I did not feel welcomed nor understood for my abilities. Group organizers did not always explain what I needed to know to have a successful, fun, and safer experience. And far too often, I did not experience groups of people with more folks who looked like me. With a lifetime of understanding nature and community under my feet, I knew how I benefited greatly from it all along. As I became a wife and mother, nature was a solid place to nurture my family and an affordable way to experience vacation, visiting local beaches and trails covered, discovered in, in travel books, often close to home. We became regulars at our city's affordable family camp where it was easy to make friends and we spent hours under the trees talking, watching talent show performances and indulging in all the eating we could at its chow palace. But still, in having these experiences, especially farthest away from Oakland, I saw a few Black people and felt like my community was missing out on all that I knew nature had given me. In my early 30s, my life changed dramatically. I was no longer married and was raising three children on my own. I decided to return to college to tend to a long neglected undergraduate degree, understanding the need to have more options to earn a living and support my family. After two years of sleepless nights of study at a junior college while working full time with determination, I found relief in an admissions letter to UC Berkeley. For the next three years, me and my kids went to college, although only one of us was sitting in its classrooms. But toward the end of my degree completion, I was looking over the edge into a country in recession. The goal of getting that great job did not seem certain anymore. So I considered business school and found support from a mentor to explore that option. But that, too, was going to be a challenge. How could I consider going away from my community, community to study intensely with my three growing children who needed me more than ever? I'll never forget the moment in a conversation with that mentor, Frida K. Porcline, who understood my dilemma and asked, if time and money were not an issue, what would you do? I opened my mouth and my life fell out. I'd probably start a website to reconnect Black people to the outdoors. It was a moment of revelation, a key that fit perfectly into the lock of this magic moment, opening the door to possibilities that are still unfolding. 
It was as if the truths of my life were hiding in plain sight and now wanted to be seen and understood. Community, nature, technology, and writing could finally be woven into a single expression. It was a moment of a true homecoming for me to be fully expressed and healed as an individual while providing a chance to help my community do the same. Soon after that talk with Frida, I pulled out my laptop and created a new blog, which I quickly yet thoughtfully named Outdoor Afro, using a borrowed template and a photo of me on a mountain in California Sierra on that transformative outward bound trip. My first blog post was titled, How Did an Oakland Girl Like Me Come to Love Getting Her Camp On? Anyway. And I told the story of growing up in a family that loved both nature and community, describing how it was possible for an Oakland girl to come to love nature and how those experiences helped me to learn, grow, and appreciate myself and others. The comments were overwhelmingly supportive. I'm so glad I found you. I'd love to camp with you sometime. Or I feel like you made this blog just for me. It was not long before I received encouraging reactions from people from all over the United States who reflected back to me their own joy and love in nature. Something was resonating. I had recently studied art history at UC Berkeley and understood the discipline and power of representation to tell stories, along with the importance of using current technologies to share that represent representation at scale. I reflected on my studies about Sojourner Truth's carte de visites or calling cards that leveraged a new technology of photography during the Civil War to create greater visibility for the movement that successfully abolished slavery and ended a war. Now, before me in 2009, was a new frontier of social media that democratized and forever changed how public relations and marketing could work. From my kitchen table, I decided to tell a new story using images, unlike anything I had seen growing up among the glossy outdoor and nature publications of black people in nature as strong, beautiful, and free. Just like what I always knew and experienced growing up. Over the following years, I gave myself over to my work with increasing focus and determination. I took a part-time job at my local Audubon where I learned about environmental conservation and later at a foundation that helped me to understand how outdoor Afro might fit into a field of work. I leveraged my years of personal and professional networking and experiences in business, the arts and community building to level up that blog to become a national and staffed organization that today broadens the definition of not only what outdoor participation looks like, but also who leads these experiences. In the past 12 years, since I sat down and wrote that first blog post, Outdoor Afro has grown into an organization that touches thousands through in-person adventure, and millions more through digital media to broaden what outdoor participation looks like and who leads experiences in nature all over the country. You'll find outdoor Afro leaders getting people out to camp in the Colorado Rockies, hike and view of the St. Louis Gateway Arch, bird watch in the Florida Everglades, canoe in the Mississippi River, and more. All while learning about the long heritage of Black people connecting in nature. Some of our trained leaders have even gone on to do capstone events together, such as climb the Sierra Heights of Mount Whitney in California, walk in Harriet Tubman's footsteps along the Appalachian Trail, and pilgrimage to the far reaches of Africa in Tanzania to find new definitions of summit on Mount Kilimanjaro, surrounded by people who look like them. This journey has taken me to many different places and introduced me to many incredible people who have become my newest wave of lifelong friends, all of which has taught me profound lessons about the personal and societal challenges that nature is adept at helping us solve. 
In the years of racial divide and civic unrest in which my work developed, we began healing hikes as a showcase of continued and expanded clarity of the power of nature to teach, transform, and heal. We can also lift up and expand on beloved historical figures such as Harriet Tubman as a true wilderness leader. She absolutely journeyed our people to freedom through nature. More importantly, it's become clear to me over the years that nature is not someplace over there. It is present within us always. Therefore, the concept of connecting people to nature is actually a journey inward and a homecoming with oneself. As I joyously learned about nature and myself over the years, I eventually felt the quickening of a book that wanted to be born so I could share the gift of our empowered story with others. I felt transported to the innocent yet powerful moment when I wrote in a journal for the first time as a child and understood there was so much more I needed to write about and share today not only of my own journey to become joyously transformed through nature, but also the stories of others who might never have had the specific and loving platform of this book, a diary all grown up. (laughs) While enthusiastically focused on Black American experiences, nature's swagger is a universal roadmap to discover the delights, joys, and possibilities of transformation for anyone through nature. You will discover the epiphanies of high adventure alongside meditations on love of a favorite place or person and poetic revelations about our wild food ways, how it can all work together, and by extension, how we can too. This book, as my father would describe it, is your standing invitation to Mm -hmm. reconnect with nature and write your own story and transform within it. Thank you so much, Rue. Thank you. That's so beautiful the way you pulled all the different threads and all your different experiences and, and skills and the things you've learned and your native talents, pulled it all together. So, a kudos to Frida Kapoor Klein for asking you that question. I love that you wrote, I opened my mouth and my life fell out. <laughs> Just great, great image. Great image about the book being a diary all grown up. And I want to make a, a reference to the fact that on the cover of the book, Nature Swagger, the title and your name are in effect carved out of the jacket like the big oak sign at the, at your family's place up in Lake County. Uh, Just, you know, one of those little tiny details that is pleasing to discover. And, and I just wanted to say, I, what I see of you as a person is you are really able to see a big picture and the details that are making up that big picture that, that you're seeing not only the forest, but the trees as well. (laughs) <laughs> so thank you for your perceptiveness. It's just so beautiful to be able to have you put into words that I might not be able to pull out of my conscious or unconscious. So thank you very much for this wonderful book and for the work you're doing. It's awesome. It's truly a pleasure and an honor. It must feel good yes. to be doing it and and seeing progress. And, and you say, I think in the acknowledgement, something about how uh, this journey is you're continuing to grow as a human being as well. And that's such a great reminder, really. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, when I think back at the beginnings, like I knew that outdoor Afro was my navigational North, but I had no idea what the journey in that direction, you know, would lead me. And it, and indeed it is still unfolding and I'm just, you know, grateful and grateful to do it, but also grateful to have the fortitude um, to do it because, you know, it's really not been, (laughs) it's not been easy. Um, And, you know, it takes a while for the parachute to open on our dreams sometimes. Um, But you know, if, if there's any takeaway here for anyone in that is to stick with it, 
and stick with your truth. And, um, you know, there will be, I was just talking to my son this morning, who's 26 years old, my eldest. Mm -hmm. And I reminded him, I was like, yeah, when I started outdoor Afro, like people, it wasn't like I had family support. It wasn't like people understood what it was. There were people who were telling me to go get a real job. Uh, (laughs) I mean, it's, it doesn't always come with a lot of affirmation along the way. Um, but, but if you stick to what your, your personal ethos is and, and why you've, you know, why you're on the planet, if, if that's, you know, clarified for you, yeah. um, by all means, give yourself over to it. Well, thinking of your children, obviously you've referred to some of the challenges of raising the children while creating this whole business. Um, but there must have been really must continue to be really positive things about that for your kids as well as for you, you know, to yeah. see their mom doing what you've been doing. Yeah. I mean, it's still unfolding. You know, I think that, you know, I have my interior life that just looks like everybody else's interior life. So my kids, they don't see, you know, my public um, life. They see their mom. Right. Yeah. And, um, And it's been really important over the years to make sure that I have those lines of separation. You know, there, there got to be a point with my kids. They were like, so we're going hiking. Is this with outdoor Afro or is it just with you? Ah. (laughs) You know, so, so it's, it's, it's been really important for me to make sure that there's enough of me for, you know, my, my children. And now for my husband, I've been, I've been remarried now for almost six months. Um, Mm. So it's another chapter. Um, It's a real wonderful thing to be able for my husband and I, who's also an outdoor enthusiast, to make sure that we have just our time and time to be connected to each other, connected to nature. And and to just remember that as much as I talk about how important it is for people to get outside, that I'm still a practitioner and I'm still getting the medicine and and lessons. And that's helped me over time to... Mm -hmm remain um, clear and empathetic uh, around what we're asking people to do. Yeah. And it feels so important that we're getting a little better at allowing ourselves and allowing the people we admire to be human, to be imperfect, to be following their process that, you know, I can look up to you or to others because of what you've done and are doing, uh, but I don't have to put you on a pedestal. You get to be a real human being, and so do I. Uh, and I know that's that's not always been the case, but it it feels so important to see that about ourselves that we we are in process all the time. Well, I mean, it's a reflection of how nature operates, right? Um, you know, think about you know, for any of you gardeners out there, when are you actually done? Yeah, never. <laughs> <laughs> like what are, it's never done. So, I mean, and so, you know, that's, that's been my touchstone, you know, whenever I have these moments, whether it be personal moments, or as you uh, heard me read, you know, these kind of big societal moments, you know, I always turn to, to the lessons that nature um, is teaching us all the time about how to be, how we see ourselves, how, how, you know, life is in seasons um, and, you know, nothing just stays the same forever. Um, and, and especially in the last few years, you know, it's been really important for me to really lean on nature, um, Mm -hmm. as a guide, uh, Mm -hmm. for how to show up, but also, you know, how to, how to rest and replenish. Yes. Rest and replenish. Well, let's talk about some of the folks in the book. You, you, uh, did the introduction. I'd love to give a shout out to the fellow who wrote the foreword, Shelton Johnson. (laughs) who's a park ranger in Yosemite. Uh, Lovely words from him, too. I really, really enjoyed that. The book is in four sections. Uh, Why did you break it up like that? Well, you know, it wasn't so much about what my will was, but how the stories organized themselves Ah. as they came in. And I didn't, I knew that I didn't want to organize this book as a how-to or to be so activity focused. So for instance, I didn't want there to be like, here's the hiking section, here's the biking section. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I really wanted to, to instead elevate the emotion 
um, or the the call to action that each contributor conveyed in their writing. And so you'll see overlap. You'll see, you know, where there may be, you know, someone who you would think might be in one section, like hands on the land might actually appear in the name of joy. Um, Because again, it wasn't centered on the activity, but how people told their story. Yeah. So as the stories came in, um, it was like, it was almost like kind of a, this like painting um, coming together. And, um, Mm. And so I was able to get more focus and clarity um, as I received probably about half of the submissions about how the themes were emerging. And then what followed um, those last contributions that came in um, fit nicely. And it, it wound up being without much, you know, like force um, or editing that people have, we had some equal uh, distribution. Uh, in the number of stories in each section. Yes. More or less, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's how the themes um, evolved. You know, it was it, it was driven um, by what these folks shared with me. And I also want to point out that, and this says, you know, something about, you know, just the process of being a writer. You know, when you ask someone to to be a part of your book, not everybody thinks of themselves as a writer. Um, it creates a lot of pressure on folks to even be asked. They're like, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm not a writer. <laughs> so it this process of pulling together over 30 people um, really helped me to understand about accessibility, about um, how to adapt to what people felt comfortable with. Yes. So some people, I recorded them and transcribed them. Some people, um, they wrote um, themselves and I edited them. I edited all of the pieces eventually, but the way that the submissions came in were all unique. Um, and for some people there needed to be a little coaching, you know, for one, one contributor, I said, Hey, just think of this as a real nice, long, juicy Facebook post. I've seen, (laughs) I've seen you do that. And they're like, Oh, I can do that. Um, and so really important. I think, um, if we want to think of how to bring in, uh, new voices that we, um, create pathways that make it more accessible. And then by extension, the book itself was, is meant to be on your coffee table. It's meant to be out in, in public view, like an art book, mm-hmm. um, and, and stories that range from, you know, just a few stanzas to, you know, several pages so that, you know, you can come and visit with it at any time um, and, and, you know, get a little portion of joy and maybe put it down and come back another time. And so it was important for me to think about all kinds of readers um, and all, you know, a wide range of literacy, as well as helping people to open the book and see people that they could relate to. So instead of having like, you know, the, the celebrities of the outdoors, you know, I was really more interested in people who are just able to tell their stories as ordinary people um, who might have extraordinary experiences connecting to nature. Well, let me just uh, name those four sections, homecoming, places of purpose, hands on the land in the name of joy. And, uh, Dear audience, uh, Rue wrote an opening essay for each of those segments, and I'm hoping we're going to have time to get to the one with, with you and your sister uh, and the kayaking. But we, we, I picked out, I picked out uh, three stories uh, so that we could have a few photos in the mix. And let's see, first one is. Darrell Smith, The Art of Bird Dogs, and this beautiful picture of Darrell and his dog and um, the, the horses in the background, too. My goodness. <laughs> mm-hmm. Who Who is Darrell? Am I saying his name right? Yeah, Darrell Smith. And I have to mention it's, you know, Darrell, it's a, it's a Darrell and Ashley Smith production uh, when it comes to um you know, the, uh, the gun dog notebook is his podcast and ah. 
um, they have become really, I, I mentor them, you know, as they have embarked on starting an organization around their work and focus. Um, but Durrell, what was so interesting about his story and how he talked about it, you know, he is, you know, you see the red, um, the, you know, Hunter Orange, he's obviously involved with the hunting world. Um, but the story was really special to me that he shared because he talked about his own awakening of this whole possibility that he never had considered around dog handling and relationship building with canines as assistance uh, for hunters. And, you know, he had seen people for the first time who were experts and in this really lovely and, and almost poetic relationship with these canines. And he's like, I want to be that guy. Like, I want to be like that. And, you know, we think oftentimes about, you know, sports figures that young people look up to. And right. he that analogy in his story. He's like, these folks were like the Michael Jordan to me. Like uh. I was, I wanted, I wanted what they had. And, and, and this is, this is the, the importance of representation, because if, if we feed people a wide variety of possibilities for themselves. Um, it makes it possible for us to think about more than just the usual buckets that we're presented with in life. And unfortunately for a lot of young black men and boys, yep. there are not a lot of lanes that they see mm -hmm. elevated figures in outside of entertaining and sports. And so for him to right. have particular awakening and to see that possibility um, is something he just dove headlong into. And now him and his wife, Ashley, um, are actually focused on minority engagement with the outdoors through hunting and angling communities. And they have been so wonderfully received in that community. And um, I'm just continuing to cheer them on. But we're, they're based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh-huh. Two of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Um, and, and ironically, Durrell is not a hunter. Like he's in uh. it for dogs. Like he's <laughs> all about the dogs. <laughs> and um, and apparently um, it, he keeps collecting dogs. Um, they have a, a, a big property in Atlanta and he's got kennels and, you know, and has yeah. you know, a really great relationship with with the dogs in his care and has become an expert or go-to resource for a lot of people who mm -hmm. uh, want to learn about gun dogs. Awesome. And, and the discovering of what you love or say, Oh, I want that. Or I want to do that. Right. It's so exciting. And it's so wonderful right. when you find that for yourself. Absolutely. Well, well, the next, the next picture I chose was of Bryson Sutton learning to swim. And there's that beautiful child boy uh, sitting in the water in his clothes, his shorts and his shirt, and clearly really loving being in that water. Yeah. You know, Bryson is a really special um, individual. Um, he's now um, he's now in middle school. Um, so this is a picture that was taken of him quite a while ago. And um, he was actually our very first swimmership participant. Um, Outdoor Afro provides swim lesson support for youth and their families who don't know how to swim. And so his experience with us, with Outdoor Afro, was a catalyst, um, recognizing the need for more people um, to get some support to connect with water um, because, you know, we know that if a child doesn't know how to swim, they're not going to put a pole in a lazy lake. They're not going to ease into a tippy kayak and they're certainly not going to care about plastic in the ocean. Right. So it's really critical for, you know, our young people um, to have that experience in um, connecting with the outdoors in a way that's very, um, you know, very much a life skill, but also what, our planet needs. Yes. And, uh, it's just, it's, he's been a continued inspiration. And interestingly enough, he has decided that one day he wants to be the CEO of Outdoor Afro. 
All right. (laughs) Your successor problem is gone. (laughs) Exactly. Um, But he's and and this is, you know, kind of back to what we were talking about earlier about representation. It's like for me, for someone, because I've I've known his mom actually since I was 12 years old. And so I I'm very much in touch with, you know, his life and his accomplishments. And, you know, it's just another example of how important it is for young people to see people like me. And this is why I work so hard to professionalize our organization. Yes. People can see like, this is a real job. Like you can actually grow up and you can work in outdoor and environmental related fields um, where you can enjoy the outdoors. Uh, Mm -hmm. You can have a positive effect on others and it's a real thing. And so if there's any, you know, part of the legacy, if you will, of outdoor Afro that I'm, I'm most excited about is for people like Bryson to say, yeah, I can do that when I grow up. And speaking of, of the, the help that outdoor Afro is giving in the swimming program, if, if parents or others want to find out what it is they can engage with outdoor Afro around, how do they do that? Yes, please visit outdoorafro.org. Um, we'll have our swim program information there. You can also just reach out to me, send me a note, rue at outdoorafro.org. I've, I, since I mentioned the swim program in these talks, you know, I'm happy for people to connect directly with me. Um, and that way I can connect them in with our program. And it's our goal this year to get 1,000 babies in the water. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, and, and let me just also give us a bit more context about why we do this. Um, you know, there was a time in a not too distant past where there were Jim Crow restrictions for um, black people that prevented them uh, from engaging with public pools, right? Even beaches, you know, so called yeah. so called public lands were not accessible in the lifetime of our grandparents. And so unfortunately, this is our inheritance. Children who are black drown at five times, sometimes six times the rate of white children ages five through 19. And I'd been hearing too many stories over the years through Outdoor Afro that, you know, there's a child who drowns, who who falls in the water, you know, threat of drowning. And then the caregivers jump in after them and everybody drowns. Yeah. So this is not just about kids, but it's also about making sure that the moms, the caregivers, the dads, the, the, the aunties, the grandmothers, everybody knows how to swim and can support a child in their learning to swim journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's a public health response. Sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, our, our planet needs more people caring about water and not being fearful of water um, in order to activate um, support for that precious resource. I'd love to go on to the third person for whom we have a a picture, Ray Wynn Grant, Wild Healing. And when I first looked at that photo, I saw her gorgeous face and I sort of saw the the thing around her neck, that doctor thing. (laughs) Yeah. And it took me a moment to see the bear. Yeah. That is a bear that she has her arm around. Yeah. Um, sedated, I assume. Yes. <laughs> so and collared. That, yes. And collared. So she and the bear are both safe. Uh, who is this marvelous woman? Yeah. I'm Dr. Ray Wynn Grant. She's a um, large carnivore um, ecologist, and uh, she spends a lot of time in the field studying large carnivores like this gorgeous creature here. Mm. Um, And she's also a Nat Geo fellow. And she and I actually met um, through the program, um, through Nat Geo. Um, That's what brought us together. And we've Uh been to collaborate. She's got an amazing podcast right now. So if you want to hear directly from her, you can check her out on your, wherever you get podcasts. But what I love of what she does and what you can actually see jump off this, this image here is the joy and the disruption. Um, you know, she she's unexpected. You know, when you think about um, what a large carnivore, um, you know, ecologist and biologist is, you know, you don't often see, you know, someone who looks like her. 
Mm-hmm. And, and this is, you know, the premise of Outdoor Afro, obviously, and, and so much of why this book was important so that people can see um, different people than you might imagine who have the, the you know, the educational expertise, but also have a real passion. And, and this is her navigational north. And what is important about her story is that she doesn't talk a lot about her work. She actually talks about her relationship with nature and she talks about how she turned to nature when she was, you know, going through a deeply personal and, and, and also publicly uh, Mm. humiliating experience with, um, you know, someone who had violated her and, and how she, you know, didn't, didn't get, you know, the kind of recognition or um, support, but that she turned to nature as a way of finding her healing through a yes. very difficult time. And so her story, even though we we see who she is and what she does for a living, um, she, like everybody else in this book, is really talking about the way to find, you know, her, her joy um, and, and her connection uh, to the outdoors. Um, and I hope you all Find each of these people, probably not so much Bryson. His mom limits his time on social media. As Good. She, um, <laughs> but certainly, um, if you want to learn more about both uh, Dr. Ray um, or Darrell and Ashley, um, you know, I, I, we, I can happily put some resources uh, in the chat for you to learn more about them and hear about what they're doing now. Rue, we have reached 11 o'clock. That fast? Oh, goodness. Time flies. It does fly. So we want to open up for questions, but I wanted to ask you, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that feels important to you to say about the book, Nature Swagger, or about Outdoor Afro, or Uh, for yourself? (laughs) You know, we're living in some strange times right now. Mm. I mean, it's just divide, divide, divide. And I always want um, this work to be a conduit for connection, for healing and for understanding. I was just um, thinking about my garden actually um, yesterday and the plans I have for the garden. And, you know, I think about weeds, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a weed is anything you don't want, right? Right. What might be considered something you don't want might actually still, and often does, have significant value to the ecosystem. Yes. Um, it, it may have value for, you know, nesting birds, um, pollinators, um, any number of things, um, shelter, shade, you name it. But we might not want it, you know? And and so we'll, we'll prune those things. We'll pull them up sometimes by the root. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I think a lot about, you know, what we can learn from that and, you know, in the, in the siloed way that many of us are, are living and pruning out those things that we don't want to connect with, or people we don't want to connect with, we might be missing something valuable. Mm. So how, how do we imagine our, the, our way, um, as humans, um, as part of an ecosystem, um, and, and as a way that, you know, regards all of us um, equally and equitably. You know, I, I've been saying that, you know, the trees don't know what color I am. You know, the yep. bird, birds still sing no matter how much money's in my account. <laughs> um, you know, the flowers bloom no matter who I voted for. And so I think there's some lessons from nature um, about how we can be with each other um, and see each other. Um, as part of the interconnectedness that we as humans um, all share. Beautifully put. Thank you so much. I'm looking to see, here's a question. What is your next personal outdoor frontier? That's a good question. I mean, (laughs) okay, so here's the thing. I love learning new things, especially new hard things. Um, Good for you. (laughs) It's really important to stay in a beginner's mind, you know, and and once you've done things for long enough, you know, you you, like outdoor after, I don't feel as much of a beginner as I did say, you know, eight to 10 years ago. Um, And so I am, 
you know, pushing myself all the time, you know, so whether it be boating um, or hunting or golf or roller skating. Um, and last week I actually did double Dutch for the first time in like 40 years. Um, and so I, I really, I really appreciate, um, you know, doing whatever I can to, you know, help my body remember, you know, it's connection. Um, it keep the muscles moving. Um, but also, you know, to just, just stay in the freshness that of learning, um, Mm. And I've had a chance to do like a lot of outdoor experiences. I've been to the Arctic uh, refuge. um, I've seen biblical numbers of porcupine caribou. Um, (laughs) I have traveled to Antarctica and have also seen biblical numbers of penguins. Uh, (laughs) um, And I am headed actually to Norway um, in June um, for another kind of adventure. Um, But for me, it is like, down to the neighborhood walk often, you know, it's about getting around the neighborhood and seeing what's in bloom, speaking to my neighbors, petting their dogs. Um, those, those activities actually help me feel rooted and, and connected to community, um, in a way that's just so important and, and sustaining, um, alongside, you know, opportunities to have more iconic experiences. Another question. Could you please talk a bit about your healing hikes? Do these address trauma by trained therapists? They do not provide trauma um, support by therapists. Healing hikes are simply a way of recognizing that we can come into nature and let it go and be very intentional about the things that we're, you know, and sometimes we address those things in opening circle, or maybe they're, you know, things that people discuss more discreetly amongst themselves on a trail. But the big aha moment for me to do the healing hike was, it was 2016 and, um, you know, cities were exploding. Um, Yet there was another amplification of a police involved violence. And there were a lot of different feelings about what to do, um, what to think, how to, you know, how to respond. And I remember like walking from my my office in Oakland and there's like helicopters overhead and people are boarding up their windows. And I, I talk about this in the book. And I asked, you know, myself, like, what what am I supposed to do right now? You know, as a black woman running a black focused organization, championing people to be outside. What's my role in this moment? And the answer came, you know, you could say it was God, the universe, but it was clear as a whistle. And it was, you do nature, Rue. That's your lane. And that weekend I brought 30 people into the woods. I didn't know what 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 a healing hike was going to look like. But I was like, let's get together in the woods and let's just be together. And we were there in that Redwood Bowl. There were no helicopters overhead. There were no police and riot gear. There were there was no tap, tap, tap of plywood being, you know, put on windows. It was peace. It was that quiet and being with one another. And that forest, that redwood forest and the bowl of redwoods that we hiked into was absorbing that for us. And as we got down, down, down to that redwood bowl, we were walking along the stream, uh, uh, um, this trail um, next to a stream. I realized that we were doing what Black people have always known we could do. And that was to lay down our burdens down by the riverside. We'd been singing that song in our churches, in our homes for generations. And here we were in that moment, standing on the shoulders of our ancestors who have laid out the plan for us to follow. And that is, that's, that's the birth of the healing hike for outdoor Afro. Mm -hmm. And it's, and again, it is, it is about holding space. And it is about turning to nature for our answers as well as for our healing. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the questions is, do you have a favorite spot in nature that you return to again and again? It's the Redwoods, for sure. 
Um, you know, I think a lot about, you know, our Semper Virons and how, you know, they were clear cut in service of, you know, the big demands for housing around the gold rush and, you know, but they're back um, or otherwise preserved in, in, in special areas um, here where they grow uniquely. Um, yes. And, you know, I just think a lot about their root systems and the interconnectedness that is underground between trees and how that helps them to sustain and grow tall and to take care of each other and, and how we as humans can model ourselves and our lives around that interconnectedness so that we can be strong, um, and, and, and grow tall, um, and not, you know, be blown over so easily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we have another question. Um, how did you stay focused on writing the book over such a period of time? Well, um, so it was in 2020. Um, so I don't know what y'all were doing, but I was at home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. so I was at home, y'all. Um, but, you know, I'd been... As I mentioned in the intro, you know, I'd been feeling and, you know, I'd been at Mesa Refuge and, you know, was originally thinking at Mesa Refuge about, you know, because I, th I was thinking a lot about conceptual art and, you know, the, um, you know, ways to make a statement about being black in the outdoors that really ties closely to what I eventually wrote about. But I really wanted to make a, a clear, a clear and declarative set of statements about black connections to nature. Um, and, you know, so it was not until 2020 where a lot of things lined up, you know, one was time, time to be still. Yes. And then I also, you know, I, I hired someone to help keep me accountable. And I, uh, I think that's something that a lot of people should look into. Um, Call you up every day or get you to no, send just, what you've been writing? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can work out whatever schedule you want, you know, but it started off with me just getting back into writing. And so just doing some free form, you know, thematic, um, you know, essays uh, about things that were important to me. And if you if I look at or go back to some of those early essays, you know, some of them absolutely made it into the book. Ah, um, and so getting kind of my writing gears lubricated was important to do. So I started doing that in early 2020. And by the summer of 2020, um, I was in full swing. And by that time, I had had um, a connection with an agent um, that was totally out of the blue. And then um, and that opened the door pretty quickly to Chronicle, um, who who supported the vision of the book that I wanted to write uh, that I wanted to write because there was some considerable pressure from a couple of other publishers who had reached out to me to write a, like a how-to book um, uh -huh. was one example. The other one was, can you talk about diversity in the outdoors? And I'm no diversity expert at all. Uh, God bless y'all who do that. I That's just not my area of expertise. And so I didn't feel really excited about writing about either of those. And then Chronicle reached out and that they you know, just shared an idea that aligned so closely with what I wanted to do. And as you mentioned, this book is filled with photography yeah. and visual representation is everything to me. And it was told to me that I had to um, avoid photography because they're too heavy. They create too heavy of a book, which in turn become heavy to ship and or expensive to ship. Right. And, and you got to sell a lot of books your first time out or you won't get another book. But I was, I, visual representation is like a, like seminal to yes. the outdoor Afro. It would have been a grave miscarriage of justice to not include um, imagery. Um, and Chronicle is a publisher um, that many of you all probably know. Um, they make beautiful, beautiful gift books. And so they, um, you know, are just so supportive of the vision. And um, most of the photos that you'll find in the book are um, submitted by the writers of the book, but we also were able to hire uh, a photographer, um, Bethany Hines, who's done a lot of work for me um, over the years to create that 
um, continuity of, yeah. of uh, representation yeah. in the cover yeah. and in the uh, chapter openings. Woo. So outdoorafro.org, lots of information there. Let me see. Um, speaking of sticking to one's lane, uh, one person in the audience says that uh, you are saying you do nature, Rue, that's your lane, reminding her of uh, a fresh air interview with the guest was ta Coates, claiming his own lane as a researcher and writer, even when people were clamoring for him to become a different kind of activist leader in the campaign for slavery reparations. What a challenging circumstance, you know, to to have to say, uh, no, that's not what I do. This this is where my strength is. This is where I know I, I can do the most. Yeah. And I think, you know, it takes, you know, and I will admit, like in those early years of outdoor Afro, when I was trying to figure out how I would actually carve out a living, um, you know, that set of opportunities, I, I did try them on, you know, mm-hmm. I, did, I did try on doing the diversity talk or consulting on, you know, getting more diverse participants into the outdoors. But I realized like that was not my superpower. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wasn't quite the narrative that I wanted to champion. Like it's so important to me in this work to talk about it from an asset based point of view. So for example, Oftentimes people will lead with a premise that, you know, black people don't do anything in the outdoors. They, we, we don't hike, we don't camp. I never see black people when I go out to where I go and see, you know, so it's like, I felt like the most generative place for me to be in this work was to make sure that I was telling the stories of what is, yeah. um, because a lot of people, they will judge what is based on their viewpoints, where they recreate, where they go. But if you actually get out of, you know, your own bubble or your own kind of sphere of, of living, there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. (laughs) You might not know. And so, and so for me, it was super important through all of our work. And this is why we tap into black history. We tap into our family history, but we also tap into like what's happening now that may kind of fall outside of the algorithm feed that you have or um, places you might go to tell this new narrative and really give people a foundation for inspiration versus a foundation for like, you know, what's wrong. And, and it's also been very important, especially when talking about the black American experience that, you know, we don't have to locate our story in pain and peril. And, and sometimes that's the expectation. Like we've got to always open with slavery, you know, right. that's a very important part of our history, but today's experience that I'm living in, you know, is, is so like mind boggling in a lot of ways. Like my grandmother was like a cook for like a wealthy white family mm-hmm. that was all she could do. I oversee a national not-for-profit organization with the kind of influence that I have today Yeah, is incredible. You know, yes. so I, I, so I stand on the shoulders of, you know, my, my parents, obviously, and my, and so many of our, our forefathers who could not in their wildest dreams have ever imagined these kinds of opportunities. And so I just, you know, always want to stop and celebrate that and not forget how far we've come. One of the historical pieces that comes out in a number of the stories is the history of black resorts. Oh, yeah. You know, we white folk don't know anything about. Uh, Fascinating. And in fact, the story of you and your sister, Delaine, in Spaces for Growth and Connection, that takes place. Is it Martha's Vineyard? Yes. And you said there's you write about like this is an an, an an enclave there that's been there for oh, uh-huh. decades. Oak, Oak, Oak's of, Bluff, yeah, 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 yeah. And this was not like uh, so. Oak's Bluff is an enclave in Martha's Vineyard, um, which was established as really a kind of a church revival community ah. in its earliest years. Um, and um, 
the, you know, the earliest black visitors, you know, came as workers, right. And, sure. but, it, but it was affordable. And so it became the place where like the black teacher, the black mailman, I mean, it was a very uh, welcoming place for working class black people mm-hmm. to uh, recreate. And, and it was a just overall welcoming community um, because of its um, kind of religious, um, you know, uh, underpinning. And so, uh, and it's continued, you know, to be this place where people pilgrim pilgrimage to every year. Mm. And, um, you know, there are places like that, that are both noted, um, or, you know, like with Pandora Thomas, you know, like that spot under the bridge where she would go fishing with her parents on Sundays (laughs) after church. Um, Uh. so it's like, it, you know, there's the, there are these very special places, um, that connect us with land, with each other. And I really wanted to give voice to place, um, as a way for us to see that even through, and what really blows my mind is like, even through like the darkest times of the black American experience, we're talking Jim Crow racism, Mm -hmm. people valued outdoor recreation so much that they established their own resorts. Yeah. And their own outfitters and their own guide services. And there were like, this is like underpinning of the outdoor industry as we talk about today. Yeah. And so I, so I really feel like, you know, Outdoor Afro as an organization stands on the shoulders of that can do um, demeanor and really says, Hey, we're going to go and find our joy. We don't care if we can't go to this beach. We can't, we, or it says no blacks allowed. We're going right. to go and create our own enclaves because we value these connections to nature for our healing, our justice and our joy that much. Um, so it, it's the tenacity is uh-huh. so inspiring. Yeah. Tenacity, perseverance. It's incredible. Um, we have a question of what thoughts you might have on the importance of getting to know place like your backyard versus experiences in, in other places, destinations, maybe those, those big iconic destinations. Yeah. I think it's so important to help people recognize that this, this idea of being in nature is not getting in your car and driving four hours to the parking lot or the trailhead. And then that's where nature begins. Right. Yeah. It's like, so right now I'm looking out my window at the lower Napa river. I see Sonoma mountain in the distance. Um, there've been several birds. I've seen a squirrel. I mean, nature is everywhere and all around us. And even just noticing it noticing the patterns, noticing the seasonality of, you know, when you can expect to see certain, you know, species of wildlife or certain types of vegetation in bloom or what, what's available at the farmer's market. Um, yeah. and, and living, you know, in harmony with that is, and and with confidence is the essence of what nature swagger is all about. And 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 so I encourage us to not think about, you know, the outdoors as some place that only a few privileged people can access. That it's everywhere, equitably for everybody by nature, um, and. You know, in this way, we don't think about nature as something that some are bereft at having the opportunity to. So like if you live in the middle of a city, Mm -hmm. still have nature all around you. I don't care if we're talking about, you know, just pigeons or raccoons or or all all those coyotes who live in big cities Right, (laughs) with us. So much. And, you know, I think organizations like National Wildlife Federation with, you know, their backyard habitat program. uh, We have, you know, Cornell University that has an excellent backyard birding program. Um, You know, there's bird cams that you can now log into these days to see. Those are so much fun. (laughs) Peregrine falcons, you know, on skyscrapers. I mean, nature, even if you choose not to see it, it is still here everywhere. And we all have to learn how to live in harmony with it, no matter where we live. Um, and so I, I'm really a big fan of, of us noticing and appreciating the assets that we have all around us and, Mm -hmm. 
and, and yes, and pair them with those, you know, big moments in nature. But if you don't have access to those big moments, just look up, look down, look all around. It's there. And it's there for anybody, no matter what you look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's at least one story in Nature Swagger that takes place in Detroit, the urban beekeepers. There's a whole lot of urban farming going Mm -hmm. on in different cities and people are are getting it that that we don't have to as you said get in the car and drive four hours to to get into nature that it is right here yeah no i loved i love uh just connecting in um with um you know my colleagues out of detroit who they looked around they saw a problem they're like there are all these vacant lots in detroit we're gonna start beekeeping i mean and think about you know the blessing that is for the planet, but also to help re-educate people about the nature of bees and why they're important, why they're important, you know, for the lessons we can learn from them, but also to our ecosystem. And it's right there where people live. Um, And so I just want to, you know, just encourage us to help support ways that people can connect to nature right in their own backyard um, and build confidence through those experiences to may, you know, then venture off into other experiences. We are getting close to the end. It's 1125. Uh, There's a question out there of what's next for Outdoor Afro and or another book. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that question. Um, But right now it's about the word of the year is savor. Mm. Um, Because, you know, we're always so like on to the next thing. You know, we don't take a moment to like enjoy what we have. You know, it's almost like, you know, you sit down and you have a beautiful meal prepared in front of you. Um, and before you eat it, you know, or finish it, someone's saying, what are you going to eat next? <laughs> and so I want to enjoy this time. Um, there's a lot of really cool things happening. Um, the book just came out um, yeah. less than six months ago. Um, so I'm enjoying that. Um, I'm it's got also- a lot of legs in it. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of legs left. <laughs> yeah, so I'm enjoying that, the chance to share with you all. Um, I'm enjoying my organization as it continues to grow. We just hired an executive director who's helping Ooh. us to really, you know, have the right foundation in place so that Outdoor Afro can be around for generations to come. Um, I started a new uh, clothing line in partnership with REI um, that launched last September. I, um, you know, have hiking clothes out here now. That all the bodies. Okay. So you women out there looking for some perfect hiking pants. I got them problem solved. Um, and then I have a new husband. Um, so there's, I have, I have a really beautiful meal of experiences, um, <laughs> moments to enjoy. Um, so I'm not thinking so much you know, further out, but, um, you know, want to just make sure I take such good care of what I've been blessed to have in this moment. Savor, swagger, joy. (laughs) Rue Map, thank you so very much for spending this time with us. I am completely inspired by your book, Nature Swagger, and blessings on Outdoor Afro and all the people with you who are creating this incredible movement understanding community. Thank you so much, Lions, for having me. Um, And thank you to all the supporters and sponsors uh, who make this work possible. Well, we want to thank Prinza, Point Reyes National Seashore Association, Mesa Refuge Writers Retreat, the New School at Commonweal, West Marin Fund, RUMAP, all the individuals, Flavia Manconi for her translation, everybody involved in in making this program happen today. Kira, Kira, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Lyons. And thank you, Rue. Such a wonderful presentation. And I just have to tell you, I'm an absolute fellow nature lover and just feel all the healing that comes every time I'm out doing whatever it is, just looking at a tree or hiking. Uh, And I love, love your book, just the feel of the pages and the beauty of the photographs. It's just such a, it's a treasure. So Mm -hmm. everybody, please go, go look at it, go get it. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, I just want everyone to uh, just remind everyone we're going to have the recordings from this conversation posted. You can find them on tns.commonweal.org. And you can find The New School on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So uh, until the next time, RUMAP and Lions Filmer and everyone at Mesa Refuge and Prenza, thank you for joining us at The New School at Commonweal. We'll see you next time. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 River is a healer, the river is a sink, the river knows no end and the river feels no way.